Hey, let me show you something. You may have seen these pictures comparing present day Singapore to how it looked in the 70s. Are you also blown away by the progress this small nation has achieved in such a short time? But as I dug deeper, I discovered there's more to Singapore's success story than meets the eye. August 9, 1965. This is the moment that will change a nation's destiny. You see, the whole of my adult life. The leader of Singapore becomes emotional. His nation's fate hangs in the balance in the wake of a fateful decision by the Oil Rich Federation of Malaysia to expel the small city state. I had believed in Malaysian merger and the unity of these two territories. At this juncture, Singapore is like a small fish swimming among big sharks. With no natural resources to speak of, it functions primarily as a modest trading port. Most Singaporeans live in slums, around 70% of them. But they had something that not every nation has, a visionary leader. Lee Kuan Yew had a difficult task ahead, ensuring Singapore's survival in a region dominated by formidable neighbors. Weeks later, the leader of the newly independent nation of Singapore gave a speech that will forever be remembered. I'm calculating in terms of the next generation, in terms of the next hundred years, in terms of eternity. And believe you me, the next thousand years, we will be here. Today, Singapore ranks as the world's fourth richest nation per capita. With an average income of 106,000 US dollars, Singaporeans are nearly twice as wealthy as Americans and beat most Europeans too. But is this the whole story? What have you not been told about Singapore's success story? How did a small country in Asia with almost no natural resources become so rich? I'm heading to Singapore to find the answers. The flight from Washington to Singapore is long and indirect lasting about 24 hours. While in the air, I reluctantly chose not to rewatch my favorite show. You're goddamn right. Instead, I purchased a Wi-Fi package to do some research about the country. The more I read about this country, the more questions I had. Singapore is the third most densely populated country in the world. The city-state crumbs nearly 6 million people into an area of less than 400 square miles Singapore is roughly the same size as Los Angeles, but harbors nearly as many people as Maryland or Denmark for our international audience. If that's not clear enough, each square kilometer of land in Singapore is home to 8,000 people. For comparison, in the US, we have only 34 people per square kilometer. But how is it possible to make so much money in such a small area? Despite its compact size, this island nation has some stunning beaches, a skyline that seems to touch the clouds and lots of green space that offers a refreshing escape from the urban hustle. They even have gardens in the sky, literally. In this multi-religious nation, most are Buddhist, but there are also many Christians and Muslims, comprising nearly 19% and 16% of the population, respectively. A warm welcome to Changi Airport. Upon landing, the city's state-of-the-art airport served as the first indication that it was about to enter a technologically advanced nation. The immigration officer was an automated machine that scanned my passport letting me into the country. No questions asked. That was cool. In Singapore, I'm meeting Yvonne, a prominent 38-year-old content creator. She explains that the country's economic growth has been hand-in-hand hand with its proactive adoption of cutting-edge technologies that have improved people's lives. Um, I grew up with technology developing, so I went from the times when you used cash for every single thing, you had to go to the bank for every single thing that we wanted to do, you had to queue for things, we had to basically get, you know, write down paper, fill out forms, but these days it's so easy, we don't need that anymore, we can just use our phones, and everything is just done with a touch on the app, mm -hmm. or, uh, you know, filling out a few details. In other words, you gotta be smart to get rich. We know Singapore is wealthy. Its real GDP is more than half a trillion US dollars. That's more than Chile, which has three times as many people, and Iraq, which is five times larger in population. And Singapore's unemployment rate is below 2%, among the lowest in the world. 
But how smart is Singapore exactly? Ivan provided some examples. She says there's a mobile app that allows Singaporeans to do pretty much everything, including filing taxes and renewing passports at the push of a button. Singapore has declared itself an e-government where it says citizens can do 99% of their services online. Do you remember last time you had to go to a government office or to a bank? No, I just make a phone call. Yeah, I just use an app to even even our housing development boards. When you see litter on like a HDB block, right? If you want to file a complaint about it, just go to the app, take a picture, send it, and then tomorrow it's clear. Yeah, so that's. And and um, you don't use a physical ID anymore, right? I don't bring it out anymore. It's just at home for safekeeping purposes. So if like you're like let's say pulled over by the police or. Uh, you can just show them your phone. Yeah, we have an app on the phone okay. for that. Wow. Yeah. While many countries struggle with bureaucracy, corruption and outdated systems, Singapore has emerged as a global leader in digital governance. In certain things, it ranks ahead of some of the most developed nations too. My boyfriend is from Japan and he has mentioned to me multiple times and my friends from Japan as well, like yeah. how when they want to get something done, it's so difficult. They have to physically go to the bank to queue and they use the a stamp to get things authenticated and that's like ridiculous in this day and age. The country has an incredible public transportation system. The subway is super clean or at least a little cleaner than New York's. I just want you to love me. Love me. I just want you to hold me. Hold me. Singapore's reliable subway coupled with a strict government policy to discourage buying cars have made the city's ground transportation way more manageable. Aside from the car purchase, you need a certificate to own the car, and the certificate alone right now is about 110000 Yeah. That's nearly $81,000 that you must pay the government just to get a 10-year permit to drive a car. So owning a car here is pretty much for the upper middle class or wealthier folks. That's why only about 15% of Singaporeans have cars. The rest of the population relies on the much cheaper MRT or the metro. Every day, over 3.5 million people use the MRT to get to work, school, or wherever they need to go. In Singapore and around the world, people often credit Lee Kuan Yew for the progress this nation has achieved. It had a wise man leader in Lee Kuan Yew. The architect of its success, Lee Kuan Yew. And Lee Kuan Yew became its first prime minister and the father of the nation. A wise man from Singapore named Lee Kuan Yew. Remember the before and after pictures of Singapore that I showed at the beginning of the video? A prominent African journalist initially posted them on his X or Twitter account praising Lee Kuan Yew. Singapore has no natural resources to speak of, he wrote. What it got was leadership. So who is Lee Kuan Yew and what exactly did he do? Lee was born on September 16, 1923 in Singapore into a Chinese family. He got his education in the UK, earning a law degree in 1949 from Fitzwilliam House, Cambridge, where he topped the honors list. Initially, Lee had socialist ideals, but after assuming leadership of Singapore, he broke up with the communists. After realizing that a free market economy seemed like the only way for his nation to thrive, he invested heavily in education, embraced cutting-edge technologies, and turned the country into an investment-friendly place for foreigners to work and live in. Singapore's universities consistently rank among the top 50 in the world. You might have seen this professor before. I interviewed her in a previous episode about AI. At a Singapore university, she worked with her students to create a powerful humanoid robot. This professor also works at a Singapore university trying to find a cure for human aging. I produced another episode on that as well. In 2015, Lee passed away at the age of 91, but his legacy lives on. Today, his son serves as the Prime Minister. There is a clear understanding that uh, being a business-oriented country was in the benefit of society. Of course, uh, not everything is perfect. Uh, there are many, many challenges. But it's a small country with a small population that can organize themselves and be attractive uh, for the world and, and for the region. I was advised to visit the National Museum of Singapore to get a glimpse of the impressive progress that Singapore achieved during his tenure. Singapore has not always been this smart city it is today. Not long ago, it was a small trading port uh, where at, it says here uh, people were busy uh, doing shipbuilding, 
gold working and recycling of glass. The MRT, for example, dates back to his time. Lee knew that economic growth without a reliable transportation system would be impossible. Listen to this. Shortly after independence, Lee's government worked with the United Nations to undertake a comprehensive, future-oriented study of the country. The study forecasted that Singapore's population would nearly double to 3.4 million by 1992. And that called for better transportation infrastructure. After nearly two decades of construction, the MRT started operations in 1987 and has been expanding ever since. Singapore was a British colony for 144 years, ending in 1963. That explains why English remains the country's first language. But like other English-speaking countries, Singaporeans have their own version of English known as Singlish. Chop. That's basically all I need to do to reserve this table and now I can get in line to get my sandwich. Chop is a Singlish term that means claiming something like reserving a table at a restaurant by placing something on it. What could go wrong? So what makes Singapore stand out? How did it achieve so much in such a short time? Conservative economists like the late Milton Friedman credit Lee's free market policies including low taxes, few capital restrictions and zero tolerance for crime as reasons for Singapore's success. Western companies and banks have branches in this country, which is ranked among the world's top 10 safest countries. Liberals also applaud some of the government's social services, such as subsidized housing and healthcare. And this sign you will see quite a lot here in Singapore. But some of the laws are considered too draconian. For instance, smoking shisha is prohibited, and possessing marijuana can lead to execution. Despite holding regular elections, Singapore is not considered a competitive democracy. It has weak opposition parties and scholars have labeled it an illiberal democracy or authoritarian capitalism. But the biggest challenge facing Singapore is not political, it's mother nature. This country is way too hot. With less than 90 miles away from the equator, it consistently has high temperatures and high humidity throughout the year. Heat isn't just uncomfortable, it's also a major health risk. It can cause chronic health conditions, kidney damage, and even death. Look at all these air conditioner units behind me. They're in a street known as the air conditioner alley. This alley is a testament to Singapore's struggle with urban heat. But can anything be done to cool down this beautiful country? Singapore is not a nation that will easily give up. In its journey to become a prosperous and modern city, Singapore had to cut down trees and build high-rise apartment buildings to accommodate its growing population. But now, after paying a big price, it's trying to change course. As the world continues to heat up, Singapore has found ingenious ways to cool itself down and combat urban heat. Last year, the New York Times published this article explaining two major ways that Singapore is using to lower its temperature, have more trees and plants in existing buildings, and change the design shape of upcoming ones. One of the innovative solutions to cool Singapore is sky gardens like this one at Park Royal Collection Hotel. The difference in temperature here compared to the bustling streets down below is nothing short of remarkable. Pomerio Studio is one of the companies helping Singapore become more eco-friendly. We created the first carbon negative house in Singapore. When building a smart city, Jason says, there are three generations to keep in mind. The first one is a top-down approach involving the use of technology to tackle urban challenges like crime, congestion and pollution. The second one is reactionary as people start questioning the first approach. And the third generation, which is the most desirable, is when the government involves the public in decision making about building a smart city. So I think Singapore is in an interesting place because it has all of the trappings of a society which is following government's pledge to create a smart nation. It's all very much focused on corporations and a government top-down approach to creating the structure of a smart nation. But at the same time, it's looking at the third generation where you've got the elements of open space, greenery, driving down consumption, and also thinking about how this can be a better place to live. 
Apart from planting more trees, the city has seen a rise in uniquely shaped buildings designed with climate change in mind. Behind me is a hospital, which might be somewhat concealed by its surrounding trees. According to the New York Times, the V-shaped design of this hospital in Singapore is an innovative architectural solution, allowing for better airflow and less reliance on air conditioning. But critics argue that Singapore is not as green as it claims. They say, as the city transformed into the affluent and modern state it is today, it inadvertently compromise its long-term sustainability. I think you cannot deny that Singapore is deploying interesting innovations to keep um, the city as cool as is possible. For example, growing greenery around buildings to reduce the need for air conditioning. But the fact remains that Singapore is so highly urbanized already. There's so much concrete that has replaced green areas. Um, and you cannot replace secondary forest with tree planting schemes. You cannot, and it's come to a stage where in 10 to 15 years, will Singapore be actually livable, given how much concrete there is, how much relying on air conditioning to keep the island cool when we've lost so much forest. So this innovations, while impressive and make um, good headlines in the New York Times, actually people living here, I think it's a very different reality. And another aspect of that is the workforce that Singapore relies on to keep building. It relies very heavily on foreign workers, especially from South Asia, that work outside building these amazing buildings you see all over the city. 10 to 15 years, it will not be safe for these people to work outside because it's so hot here and so humid. Everything seems to come at a price. Singapore's average per capita income today is nearly five times that of Malaysia, the country from which it was forced to split. Despite the climate challenge and the country's mild authoritarianism, Singaporeans mostly feel content. Last year's United Nations Happiness Report backs this up, ranking Singapore as the happiest country in Asia and one of the happiest worldwide.